Tenakoto Kato, Kiorana Tato Katoto. Welcome everyone. Um, it is a pleasure and privilege to be here uh, talking to our monetary policy statement, um, which we released just a short time ago. Uh, I want to thank our Monetary Policy Committee members who are here all bar one. Caroline Saunders passes on her apologies. She has been with us the whole time, but we've got Peter Harris uh, and Bob Buckle um, uh, with us here today, and of course Deputy Governor Geoffrey Baskand up front here, and the two wise folk beside me, Kristen Hawksby, Assistant Governor, and Jung Ha, Chief Economist at the Reserve Bank. Uh, I do want to thank the Reserve Bank's economics team, uh, well trained, focused and committed as they are, for their mahi over the last week or so as we put this together. The decision to keep the official cash rate at 1% uh, is a consensus decision um, uh, and it has been well debated and I'm very proud and pleased to be able to write the summary record of the meetings because I hope it gives you a bit of a richness of the flavour of the issues that we have to discuss, rather than just the short one-page summary and or the projections. So uh, I encourage all to read. Uh, as you've seen, the Monetary Policy Committee has decided to keep the official cash rate at 1%. Uh, employment remains around its maximum sustainable level and inflation remains below the midpoint, uh, the 2% inflation midpoint of our target range, but well within the 1% to 3% inflation range. Uh, the economic developments we have observed since August uh, did not warrant a change in our very stimulatory monetary policy stance, um, so hence we have remained at the 1%. Uh, economic growth uh, did continue to slow from mid-2019, reflecting weak uh, business investment and soft household spending. Uh, we expect economic growth to remain relatively subdued for the rest of this calendar year. Some, of course, has already been banked but not measured or reported. Uh, and, of course, we will continue to monitor the economic developments uh, as, as they are measured and unfolded over coming months. Trading partner growth has also slowed. Um, growth in global trade and manufacturing was especially weak and political uncertainty and economic uncertainty remains at elevated levels. Um, this has been dampening global business investment. Uh, the good news is that New Zealand commodity prices uh, have been robust, uh, underpinning a positive terms of trade and the lower New Zealand dollar exchange rate over the last year or so has been a very useful, important support to New Zealand's earnings and a buffer against the weaker global economic environment. Uh, our projections are for domestic economic activity to expand further during 2020, supported obviously by low interest rates, this very stimulatory monetary policy position, higher wage growth and increased government spending and investment. The low OCR has flowed through into lower lending rates and uh, more generally we see that supporting spending and investment. And rising capacity pressures are projected to promote a pickup in business investment over the coming year or so. Uh, the committee uh, uh, the, have a strong consensus view that interest rates will re need to remain at low levels for a prolonged period of time to ensure inflation reaches the midpoint of our target range and that employment remains near the maximum sustainable level. Uh, we remain committed, obviously, to our policy purposes, targets and goals. Uh, we are doing our very best to be as transparent as possible around how we come to our decision making. And of course, we will add further monetary stimulus if needed. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are open for questions. Please. It, it'd be um, great if you could just introduce yourselves um, primarily that a lot of people are sitting behind you. Sure, Kim Savage from RNZ. Uh, to what extent was this a line call and what brought the committee down on the side of holding as opposed to cutting? Yes, uh, I mean, the line call is really interesting because the projections, as we note, particularly in our record of the meeting, could be consistent with a hold or a, or a, a one cut to 0.75. 
But the real issue for us is that we know we have uh, very stimulatory monetary conditions at the moment. Uh, uh, often uh, I've heard it to say if the next move is very difficult to decide on, it means you're probably in a good place where you are now. And I think that weighed on us to say we have the ability to observe the data knowing that we are adding significant stimulus to the economy and we want to be able to observe some of the outcomes. We've also been reasonably um, you know, balanced by the data that has come since the August statement. We've had the ups and the downs broadly offsetting each other, so no real desire to be um, uh, to seeing an, an urgency to any further easing at this point. Just to follow that, uh, with your forecast for growth to remain subdued through to the end of the year then, so how does th is this a departure, I suppose, from your approach uh, the last couple of times, uh, a sort of a preemptive approach, cutting early? Uh, no, we've always um, been looking at inflation, you know, one to two years ahead. Uh, our significant cut in August was the fact that it was very clear, given the developments that happened, uh, you know, prior to that, that we weren't in the right place. Um, that uh, that uh, global inflation was a lot lower, global economic growth was a lot lower, and we needed to adjust our monetary policy. Uh, market pricing had probably three cuts, uh, our own forecast, uh, two plus some, and we thought, let's just do it so that we can be in the fortuitous position we are now, where we know we're stimulatory, we know we're in a position where we can observe without continuously playing catch up. So it's never about, uh, it's always about your best projection forward looking, and it's always being as transparent as we can. Anything to add, wise folk? Um, it's not just about economic growth, of course. We've got some ups and downs, so the exchange rate is lower than what we assumed this time in August. Um, but also the terms of trade are also holding up, so again, it's the ups and downs, and it's not, a, not, a, not as bleak a picture as it was back in August. And in reference to growth remaining subdued through till the end of this year, we are nearly at the end of this year already, so we are projecting things to pick up from here. We know that there's monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus coming through and they underpin our projections. Um, Two-year swap rates are up 21 basis... Oh, sorry, Janae Tipsharani from interest.co.nz. Two-year swap rates are up 21 basis points. The five-year rate is up 19 points and the 10-year rate up 15 points. Just to put some figures in there. Um, are you concerned that mortgage rates will go up? Uh, I mean, that's going to be for the retail banks themselves to, to decide. Um, there's plenty of margin involved in lots of business competitive decisions between the, the numbers you've quoted, um, both one, how the official cash rate feeds through into market expectations and forward pricing. This is obviously a one-off um, instant market. Two, about how that forward pricing feeds into a competitive banking sector and what they do with, with their mortgage rates. What we've made very clear here is that we believe monetary policy is very stimulatory and that we will have to keep it at that position for a prolonged period of time. And if circumstances change, we will act. So, um, you know, really they have to make um, commercial business decisions about what they want to do with their customers. Just, just to add on market pricing, markets are currently pricing a 20% chance of a, a cut in February and a 50% chance of a cut by November uh, next year. And we'd expect those percentages to move around with the economic data as it evolves. And I'd also just add, um, over the year, we've actually had um, mortgage rates fall between 50 to 150 basis points. So while we've had a bit of a short-term blip, we're still providing a lot of stimulus through the economy, and it has been feeding through to the retail rates that households are facing. OK, and I just have a question about fiscal stimulus. Um, I note that the, uh, the aren't sort of called for more fiscal stimulus quite in the same way that there were... Um, in the August NPS. Could, could you please explain why? Uh, I think because um, uh, you don't have to keep shouting, um, you know, to the extent that it's been repeated many, many times in the press, uh, I imagine that it's been heard. We don't have anything to add to that. Um, you know, we've been working through uh, what we can do with our tools, um, how we are trying to achieve our inflation projections and uh, fiscal policy will be, will 
you know, be stated. Uh, we are confident around the current policy setting. We put a little um, uh, bracket there, uh, you know, the hope that it is followed through on. Um, but we operate off whatever the current fiscal policy is. Hi, Jenny Ruth from Business Desk. Um, you said you're trying to be as transparent as possible. The market was clearly very surprised today and, Christian, you mentioned that you've been monitoring market expectations. Mm -hmm. um, I was told last night it was extremely short and that we'd get the reaction we saw yep. just now if you didn't cut the OCR today. The market was also surprised back in August... Is, is this a, a desirable state of affairs? Do you want to be having successive mark, um, OCR decisions surprising the market? No, it's certainly not our um, uh, conscious intention to try and surprise folk at all. Um, you're talking about uh, a specific group of people looking at the data. What we're trying to do is uh, provide a clear sense around what we're concerned with, how we pull the data together and how we make decisions. Uh, market pricing and market expectations have been moving around considerably, um, uh, both between and then just before we've gone from close to 50-50 to 90-10 to all over the place based on data that's coming in. We want the market to be thinking, or, or these people who are putting these comments down, to be thinking very hard around, around what we should do and provide market signals around that. And so we are trying to be as transparent as possible. Christian, any? No, I, I, I think that's that's exactly it. Yeah, market pricing has been has been moving, and through the whole period since August, we've moved from a 50, 50 or 100 percent priced for for this meeting to 50 50. It was inevitable that um, some part of the market was going to be surprised which, whichever way we went. Market pricing will often try and follow trends. One means there must be many more to come. We did two in one go, so, so they must have thought, well, there must be a lot more to go. We were at odds to say, no, we don't know anything in addition to what we've told you, but um, they have priced accordingly, and here we are. Uh, Thomas Coughlin, um, staff. Um, your projections for um, CPI and GDP in 2020 and 2021 have changed um, somewhat since the last NPS. So the uh, CPI in August was uh, projected to be 1.7 over 2020. Uh, it's now 2.1. Um, and then with uh, GDP, I think now uh, in, um, in the last NPS, it was uh, projected to be 2.4 growth in, um, in 2021 and um, now it's 2.1. So what's what's underlying that, those, those changes in yeah. the projections? I mean, it, um, um, well spotted and this is, you know, it, Thomas is highlighting how we try to be as transparent as possible. Sitting amongst those numbers, first of all, there has been some, you know, some new CPI data. So there's been some one-off price shifts. Um, there are always one-off price shifts, by the way, but this particular set were to the northwards, road user charges, airfares, what else came through? Council rates. Council rates, um, all those all those one-off up, and so that's a higher starting point on the CPI inflation and, and the near-term projection. On the growth side, uh, we have had lower than, uh, uh, you know, that lower growth over the second half of 2019, and, and the indicators are that it's going to stay that way for this calendar year, so there's the lower, um, lower anticipated growth. And also sitting in there is a sense of a lower potential growth rate in the economy, in part because of lower net immigration. And so even with even with slightly lower growth, you still have the same capacity pressures. So so it holds up inflation even though the nominal growth rate is lower. So that's you know that's where we've that's where we've um, come out on balance. Um, potential growth being being made up by how many people they are there are, uh, the capital I've got to use and how productive they are in the use of that capital. So you know it's the population is growing slower. Hello, Charlotte Greenfield from Reuters. Um, how much did the Q4 inflation expectations survey factor into your decision today? And if you don't see expectations for inflation creeping back up towards 2% um, next year, how much weight will you start to put on that? Yes, yeah, so I mean, inflation expectations are 
very important to us. Um, our challenge is there are various measures of inflation expectations. There are the surveyed expectations which we talk about in our document um, and that's across a variety of time horizons, one, two, five, ten year. Uh, the nearer term inflation expectations have been softer. We do see those move around a lot with just actual inflation. So if actual inflation has been lower, nearer term expectations tend to be lower. But we take some comfort from the fact that the five-year, ten-year inflation expectations are remarkably well anchored at the midpoint of our target, providing great credibility to these wise people here um, that we will achieve um, our inflation objectives on average through time. Other measures, uh, in particular market pricing, where you can back out inflation expectations effectively by the difference between uh, nominal bonds and inflation-linked bonds, you have seen the inflation component of that rise um, since the August statement. So while we've seen soggier short-term surveyed expectations, we've seen some firming in actual market pricing expectations. A big part of that has been that global nominal bond yields have, have increased um, you know, over this period. I think the US was down at the 1.2s, it's back up mm. at the 1.9s, and, and we're, we're anchored off that, that global um, benchmark. So in short, higher near-term inflation should probably see higher near-term inflation expectations if that story follows through. Hamish Rutherford from the New Zealand Herald. I've got a couple of questions. First of all, could you tell us um, what feedback you've had about what the impact of the 50 point basis point, 50 point cut had on business confidence? Uh, in our document, actually, we've had a lot of fun between statements. We've been from Kaitaia to the north to Bluff to the south, 60-plus um, business visits um, split up between um, many folk. Uh, many things, ha we were told, are impacting on business confidence. Uh, monetary policy and the level of interest rates will whirl down the page of lists of concern. In fact, we had to keep bringing it up ourselves amongst many customers. The big concerns were uh, global news and noise, policy uncertainty, uh, uh, environmental change uncertainty, ability um, to attract and retain skilled labour, infrastructure demands and needs. So working down that list, we eventually got to monetary policy and the level of interest rates. So, you know, we weren't um, hearing a lot. Without doubt, there was a residual. I don't know whether it came direct or fed through second hand from commentators slash journalists that perhaps we know something, you know, we being the Reserve Bank know something the rest don't and hence jumped at a shadow. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm only reading what you've written really through that, through that press. Um, am I underselling that? Christian, tell me that I'm wrong or Jung. No, it's, no. it's right. And um, secondly, you've taken out the reference to fiscal stimulus, but you say the message hasn't really changed. I think in the last update, you talk about the need for, for long-term investment. Could you, could you talk, talk us through what you would like to see? Because I think there's possibly a bit of concern that when the government does look to long-term investment, it can actually take a year or two to get going, and so they may miss the boat if, if yeah. it's coming to the rescue of the economy. Yeah, I mean, we, we agree. By the way, um, uh, you know, we are talking about the fiscal stimulus in here. We take it as given. We've said there's a risk that there could be more. There's a risk that what's promised could be slower. Um, you know, so that's, that's always the case. Uh, we've also been speaking just outside of the monetary policy statements, both in speeches that um, Christian, Jeff, and myself have given around the place where, you know, we've been quite open that, that monetary and fiscal policy have a significant role in the economy. Globally, monetary policy has been doing most of the heavy lifting around cyclical management, uh, but globally, monetary policy, you know, has been steering down the barrel of these zero bounds and unconventional tools and all sorts. <coughs> is that the gym? Yeah, Sorry. Oh, I've got my own. Here you go. <laughs> you don't want to be spreading what I've got. That's um, um, <laughs> Probably another reason we left rates on hold. So. Um, the uh, oh, that's better. The uh, what we're seeing is that uh, a first order New Zealand, I would say, at the simplest state, is in a very, very fortunate position relative to most OECD countries. We have very well identified infrastructure demands and needs. 
We have a government balance sheet that is looking healthy, um, both historically and relative to many other countries. We have uh, secular, secular low nominal interest rates, which is the hurdle rate to investment. And so, um, you know, this is, if needed, a time to be fiscal spending. So it's not like we are looking for money to put into some place that we're looking to spend. And so that, is, that has been our broad story. Um, but, you know, that's not our job. They will do what they do. And we've made our, our message very clear. Meanwhile, we will continue to do whatever it takes with our tools. Uh, many countries have suggested that monetary policy tools may be secondary to some of the fiscal policy tools. Um, we're not in that position at the moment, but we always like to have friends. Um, I'm wondering how important is house price inflation and the wealth effect to you as a channel for delivering the monetary policy stimulus? It, it is and will always remain an, an important channel um, because just the significant weight of household wealth being in home equity, home ownership. So that perceived wealth that the value of my house has gone up, um, I, can, I can spend more, I can feel more confident in my spending or I can even borrow more and leverage more, etc. is a big channel in the New Zealand economy. Um, on the way through. Having said that though, there are many other monetary channels that we're very pleased to see operating the, the, the relatively stimulatory level of the exchange rate and export earnings in terms of trade improvements are all about nominal income growth in New Zealand. Likewise, the hurdle rate for invest, investment and business investment and government investment are all important hurdles. So this is uh, not a, a one pony show, it's about saying general business investment is in a opportunistic position. But um, given how high household debt levels already are uh, and a chronically negative household saving rate, how do you weigh the monetary policy objective with the constraint you have about financial stability and those kinds yeah, of things? Yeah, um, carefully is the answer and appropriately. Um, and to be more accurate, uh, monetary, the official cash rate is primarily about a blunt tool for the economy as a whole for inflation spending. <laughs> and we are highly confident that lower interest rates into a net impetus for higher investment and spending in the country, and that's been in large part because the average debt well outweighs the average savings. It's a blunt tool. It means that savers, you know, can be annoyed on their income flow, um, uh, but likewise there are more borrowers than savers, so it's a net stimulatory, but it is a blunt tool. Of course, some of those savers are also some of the asset owners, and so that does mean that their net wealth position has improved as well, so it's not, you know, there's the stock and the flow decision, but it, it's a blunt tool. We know that lower interest rates uh, promote more spending, more investment uh, on the way through. The other part is using the right tool, you know, because you have a hammer and not everything is a nail. And so, you know, the monetary policy OCR would be the hammer. Uh, we have other tools for other concerns. We have bank capital to make sure, for example, that banks are well capitalised and can manage the ups and downs and good times and bad and be long time friends. Uh, we have the loan to value ratios and the macro prudential tools that we have to look for very highly indebted pockets of the economy and how can we make sure that those tail risk events don't turn into core central events. So when we set our official cash rate, it is cognizant of all of those other settings. It's not despite those other settings. Going, going, oh, just about got away there, didn't we? Um, the note says that members noted that fiscal stimulus could be greater than assumed. W what has changed? Why, why is that assumption n now that? Uh, no real underlying uh, thought or information. The simple side is that we're trying to be balanced here because we often talk about we know what they've said they're going to do and then Treasury on our behalf provide the scepticism across it about well can they really get that out the door. Um, so you know they may be able to get it out quicker or slower. Um, that's really about the guts of that. So um, we'll leave it to the fiscal authorities to tell us where we're at. 
Just ask you a quick one. Can't let you away too soon. Uh, <laughs> just, I mean, you've spoken about the inflation expectations number, um, but clearly expectations of a rate cut rose when you released that data late yesterday. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, whether you see any merit in, in publishing that report a bit sooner so that everyone, you know, gets that report and has a bit of time to digest it rather than right on the eve of an MPS. So I think it's due yeah. to come out right on the eve of the next one as well. So. Yeah, oh, we, that's, that's a good point. We can look at that. I, don't, I really don't know what sits behind the timing other than um, checking, formatting and, and um, getting it out the door. So so that's right. Um, just on a general sense, it's, it's, um, it's almost every single monetary policy statement always has some big piece of data that's just about to come out the day before. Generally, it's the labour market or something. So, so finding our windows, but certainly that window we control. So we should we should um, think about that. Um, yeah. okay. And just one more. Um, I think the record of meeting does mention the work you're doing on unconventional policies. Um, obviously, you haven't moved any. We're close to zero today. But but if you do need to cut rates further, have you reached any decisions yet on how low you could go with the OCR or whether you would complement that with any other sort of policies? Yeah, we, we've um, been working through and I want to thank the team um, very well. I mean, it's a very clear uh, framework, um, you know, I'll use the word theoretical framework around what is possible, what could be used is, is, uh, is coming together. And we will make that well known um, sometime early in the new year. Um, we don't see it as urgent, hence we're not trying to sprint it through. Uh, mostly it'll be around the kind of principles that we would think about um, around the use of additional tools or a negative interest rate, for example. You know, is it effective? Is it efficient? I.e. Who, who wins, who loses? These are all blunt tools. And, and would it work? I.e. can we make it operate? Um, uh, that latter part is really important, and that latter part means we have to have conversations with banks and other intermediaries to make sure payment settlement systems to make sure that whatever instrument we choose is actually plumbed in. So, so you know that um, that framework is going well. We'll have a, a kind of a, a, a menu of possible additional tools and, and a picking order of how and when they could actually be used. Uh, we're trying to do this uh, in the safe environment of not seeing it as a core need or desire or urgent. Um, but and so uh, one hopes that uh, that is the case, you know, um, over coming months. But we will will outline the general frameworks and the type of additional tools that could be available um, in addition to the traditional interest rate tool. Thanks. And we'll be asking for plenty of discussion and feedback as well. Uh, just probably related to Matthews, but in the committee's deliberations, did it come and did it enter discussion as to whether interest rate cuts are already becoming less effective as in the in the range that we're in? Uh, uh, quite the reverse, actually. I thought if we sat back and thought, what are the what are the key messages we'd love to leave you with today? And I was very pleased with some of the headlines that have come out. The first one is that monetary policy is effective. We are seeing signs of it. Um, coming through, as one would expect, but those signs take time. Um, they're also, um, they take time amongst all the other things that are changing forever. So the effectiveness we're comfortable with. Uh, the second part is where we are currently set is stimulatory. So we know that we are south of any concept of neutral and that we are adding fuel to the, to the desire or need or want to, to invest um, on the way through and that uh, any sense of having to have additional tools is a precaution. It's not sitting as part of our core activity whatsoever, but obviously it makes sense to be prepared. Um, I think I'm quoting someone famous there, and, um, or infamous, and, um, uh, and that's what we're doing. Uh, while I've got the key messages people should leave with, what have I forgot? Um, we expect interest rates to remain low for a long time, and that's uh, a global phenomenon, not just a New Zealand-specific situation. So, you know, that adds that adds to the sense that monetary policy will remain stimulatory and, and is adding to, yeah, the economic growth outlook for 2020. Yeah. It's not just to add, keep watching the data, and that will drive our decisions from here and we'll do what's required. Yep. Yep. Follow that. Hey, Jenny. Um, I haven't read the NPS as carefully as I probably would have liked to, but how are you viewing the dairy sector at the moment? Obviously, dairy prices are a lot better, but I noted 
for example, BNZ has increased its dairy provisioning hmm. recently. Yeah, it's um, well. The good news, um, uh, what does I say? Watch this channel, um, same channel, different time. But we're back here talking in our financial stability report on the twenty seventh, and we uh, we talk a lot about about those particular pockets. Um, I don't want to snatch all the thunder from from the excitement there, but the dairy sector, without doubt, uh, has been in a much better holding pattern. Um, prices need to remain in that positive territory. Um, but even prices where they are means that some are at best only um, retaining servicing. We have seen pay down uh, people, you know, um, amortising their mortgages now, which is, um, um, and that's largely under the desire and instruction of the retail banks themselves. So there has been a very heightened awareness amongst the banks who, who have been involved in the lending over the last 10 years that enough's enough and perhaps they might have got out over their skis too much in some places. But where they are out over their skis, it has been in quite narrow, deep pockets of debt. So it's, you know, it's a, as always, it's a more interesting story once you get underneath. Um, there are some pockets of dairy that will, will struggle um, at current, will still struggle at current levels. Katie Bradford from TVNZ. Uh, speaking of signs, how much or do you think there are signs the housing market, particularly in Auckland, is starting to pick up? And how much of that is to do with low interest rates, or how much is that taken, being taken into account? Yes, I mean, without doubt, there have been signs. In fact, it's been happening far more outside of Auckland. Um, Auckland is, um, has shown some recent signs of, of, um, of uh, picking up again. But um, uh, I think what the numbers, I think it's 4% house price growth over the last 12 months on average across the country. Is that right? That was the last 12 mm -hmm. months. 8% uh, outside of Auckland. So that means Auckland's had a donut and the rest has been growing quite strongly. Um, but Auckland is starting to, to pick up. Without doubt, lower interest rates have to sit amongst that. I mean, serviceability is a big part of it. Um, affordability remains the single biggest challenge in Auckland. You know, it's just, um, um, uh, it's about getting into the loan first. The affordability side remains the major constraint. In our projections, we think that uh, what you're witnessing at the moment will be broadly about what continues over the next uh, 12 months or so. But, um, you know, we stand to be excited and surprised that supply will increase and that with the slower net migration population growth, that, that some of that, some of those extreme um, situations, um, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel on that. Have I oversold my hopes and desires in that market? That's good. No, mm -hmm. that's about it. So, yeah, the price earnings are still much higher in Auckland than the rest of the country, um, uh, um, uh, but they seem to want to try and converge with each other at the moment. Well, uh, before anyone can imagine another question, can we say thank you very much? Uh, again, a pleasure, a privilege, and um, we'll be back. Thank you.